So, so thank you very much on behalf of the team out in Peru. To clarify from the outset, when I talk about socioeconomic support, I'm talking about social support, which is information and education, and I'm talking about economic support, which is money. So what I'm going to do over the next 15 minutes is uh, really walk you through how we fight poverty to control TB, uh, linking two pioneers in this field. And the first is Rudolf Furkoff, father of social medicine, and the second of the Wu-Tang Clan East Coast <laughs> hip-hop legends. I'm going to do that in 15 minutes. So quick facts about TB. A third of the world's population is infected with latent TB. About 10.4 million new cases per year, that's more than the population of Portugal and about 2 million TB deaths per year, which is about a full jumbo jet crashing every two hours. What about Peru, where I worked? Well, if you look at the green line there, you can see that TB incidence over the last two decades has decreased dramatically, but actually now it's starting to become more static. And that means that Peru still has lots of TB. And as you'll see from the other areas with dark blue on that map, sub-Saharan Africa, the Indian subcontinent, where you find TB, you also find poverty, and that's the case in Peru. So I've been working for the last seven years with this wonderful Innovation for Health and Development team led by Dr. Carlton Evans from Imperial College in London. And that team's been looking at poverty and TB over the last decade. They work just outside of Lima, in North, Callao, North Lima in Callao, which is an area that covers about a million people. It has the highest rate of TB in Peru. About 20% of people live on less than $1.5 a day. And there's pockets of gun crime and violence, uh, such as favelas in Brazil. So it's a hard place to both work and to live. And the team haven't just been working with the Peruvian National TB program, but also with civil society here on a march on World TB Day. And also looking at the ways in which we can uh, combat poverty uh, in order to fight TB. And this, for example, is uh, a micro-enterprise making Christmas decorations, this was back in 2010, to support a patient through TB treatment. Verkov recognised this a long time ago in Europe, and in his seminal work, often Leakin Medicine and the Soiken Lira, which is social medicine and epidemiology, he said that in Europe, TB was related to living conditions. So if we look at that in a bit more detail, Actually, in Europe, the rates of TB were decreasing way prior to Koch's discovery of the bacillus in 1880, and a century before the antibiotic era was heralded in by streptomycin. And that was mainly due to the Industrial Revolution and in, uh, improvement in living conditions. If we look at the gross domestic product of countries, going to the right there on the x-axis, and the TB rates, which are the y-axis, the countries there are the circles, and you'll see that the higher the GDP of a country, the lower its TB rates. And you can look at this on a local scale as well, and we did that in Peru. The pink bars there are TB patients, the green bar is healthy controls, people who lived in the same area as the patients, but did not have TB. Patients were more likely to live in poverty. But it's not just that poverty leads to TB. TB actually worsens poverty. And in this work from Kenya by Verena Mouch and colleagues, she looked at the direct costs of free TB treatment. So getting to clinic, extra food for the patient, medicines for headaches or nausea, uh, clinic visits. She looked at the indirect costs, which was the lost income for the patients. And when you totted those up, they actually came to about seven months of, a, of, uh, of income for a household, despite the treatment ostensibly being free. And that's where the Wu-Tang Clan come in, because they were the first ones who really recognised this in terms of TB control with their seminal work, Cream. Cash rules everything around me. Cream get the money, dollar, dollar, bill, you uh, <laughs> we, we wanted to emulate this in, in TB patients in Peru. So we did a cohort study looking at cash ruling everything around those patients. And we followed patients up. I say we, the, the nurses in Peru, tirelessly followed patients up for a month throughout, every month throughout treatment. And they looked at those direct costs and the lost income that I mentioned. And they found that if that, we found that if that went over 20% of the household's annual income, it became catastrophic. And what do I mean by catastrophic? Well, just to look at it this way, if you belong to a household where you, the costs were more than 20% of your annual household income, you had a twofold likelihood of the patient in that house dying, failing treatment, or abandoning treatment. So costs matter. That threshold was endorsed by the WHO, and so was the methodology, which I'll come back to later. 
And thankfully, the WHO weren't just uh, listening to what we were doing. They also obviously listened to the WU because they said to eliminate catastrophic costs in their 2015 NTB strategy for TB-affected households. They said to do this by providing socioeconomic support, but the issue was that there's very little evidence to guide that policy change. So what this all boils down to is that we, as a research group, tried to do a scientific, expletive-free cover version of CREAM, combat catastrophic costs to reduce their effect on adverse TB outcomes in impoverished TB-affected <laughs> households. So, the hypothesis was that if you provide socioeconomic support, you're going to increase cure in patients, you're going to increase preventive therapy and prevention in their contacts, and that you're going to ultimately improve TB control. Our primary objective was to increase the TB preventive therapy initiation in the people within the household exposed to TB. So those people had to get screened, and if they had latent infection, they took it at isoniazid, which is an antibiotic, for six months. The secondary objectives were to make sure that we increased TB treatment success, so cure or completing the treatment of patients. And we also wanted to combat the catastrophic cost that I mentioned earlier in this talk. I can't really talk about these things because we don't have time, but we also aim to reduce stigma, to increase TB-related knowledge, and we're refining the intervention for scale-up, which I'll come back to. So the design, well, if we think about goals and outputs, what were we trying to do? We wanted to find TB. And how do you find TB? Well, you have to screen for it in the contacts. We wanted to prevent TB. So to prevent TB, those contacts who have infection then have to go on to start preventive therapy. And we wanted to cure TB. And so the patients had to adhere to treatment and to complete their treatment. As I've said, the overall aim of that was to control TB overall. How to do that? Well, we would randomise households to receive either the normal standard of care from the Peruvian TB programme, or that standard, plus our socioeconomic support. And that involves social support, which was household visits and community meetings. The aim of those was to educate and inform about tuberculosis and to reduce stigma. All of this stuff, the screening, the treatment, the preventive therapy, the education, was incentivized by conditional cash transfers. So we opened bank accounts with the patients, which we deposited money into on meeting some of these conditions. Just to say that this is repackaging of something that was actually done nearly 100 years ago by the wonderfully named Sir Pendrill Varia Jones in the Papworth village settlement. So in 1918, this was not a randomised trial, this was just an intervention. Uh, households affected by TB were given, asked to come to the commune, given work, nutrition, regular checkups for TB, and educated about TB. And more recent analysis seems to suggest that children in those households were less likely to develop secondary TB disease from parents who had TB. So this is really a reimagining of, of this work that was done 100 years ago, but forgotten when the antibiotic era came along. So what did we do during home visits? Again, this is tough terrain, as I told you. Well, the nurses went out to the households, usually at times where most of the household members would be in, and they educated them about TB treatment, about prevention, and also about household finances. We did community meetings every month in the 32 shanty towns in which we worked. And the first half of that was an interactive educational workshop, again, reinforcing those messages about TB, usually through a kind of game show activity which went down well in the local area. And the second half was actually a TB club, which was on the model of something like Alcoholics Anonymous. Small group work, often stimulated by drawings, uh, and, in, and we talked about stigma that people faced. And this is a drawing by one of our nurses that was used uh, as a point of uh, conversation. This chap who's got TB is being told it's a punishment from God by his priest. He's being asked to leave work by his boss. His family have left him, and in some cases, he's just experiencing stigma and isolation in the streets. We tried to focus on what we could do to empower ourselves uh, uh, um, in terms of, uh, after uh, stigma, um, in terms of taking treatment, of uh, getting back into work, of involving the family in that patient journey, and also speaking to peers about their experience about having TB. In terms of the cash transfers, so as I said, these were for screening, for adhering to TB treatment, uh, for completing it, for starting preventive therapy, and also for engaging with the social activities. Just to give you seven examples, I'll quickly run through from the first row to the bottom. If the patient said, I don't want to participate, then obviously they didn't receive cash transfers. 
If the patient gave us a sputum sample for testing but didn't participate in anything else, didn't take their treatment, they would get $14. If the patient took all their treatment, got cured, but didn't engage in the social activities, they could get up to $176. And if they did everything that was asked in terms of the treatment, the preventive therapy for their contacts, in terms of coming to the household visits, community meetings, they could get a maximum of $230. People who had HIV or people who had multi-drug resistant TB had longer treatments for TB, nine months in HIV and 24 months, up to 24 months in MDR, in multi-drug resistant TB. So they had more uh, uh, cash overall. And this number wasn't picked out of the air. From the previous study I told you about where I said 20% of annual household income was catastrophic, half of that was made up of direct costs. And what we wanted to do was try to mitigate those direct costs. We thought this number of $230 through working with the National TB Program was suitable to be sustainable for the program, but also large enough to be an incentive for the households. So what were the results of the study? Well, we invited over 300 households to participate, of which 282 uh, said that they would participate. We then randomised those households to the intervention or the control arm. In terms of our primary outcome of preventive therapy initiation, we looked at the household contacts. And in terms of our secondary outcome of TB treatment success, we looked at the TB patients. I could talk to you all day about the cash transfers and the intricacies of those in the community meetings, but we don't have time. So just to summarise it, we had nearly 1,200 potential cash transfers, of which we made 80%, so just under 900. The average total cash transfers per household were $183, and this would add approximately 17% per patient to each patient for the Peruvian National TB programme. And we conducted over 50 community workshops in the 32 Shantytown communities within which we worked. So what did this mean in terms of our primary objective, initiation of TB preventive therapy? Well, in the dark bar is the contacts from the intervention household. And we increased the uptake, the starting of preventive therapy, from 26% to 44%. So you're more than twofold more likely to uh, uh, have uptake of preventive therapy. And if we imagine that if we were to scale this up, Peru has 31,000 TB patients per year, 62,000 contacts, therefore, uh, will be eligible to receive preventive therapy. And actually, that, that could, if we scaled it up, mean that 11,000 more household contacts start TB preventive therapy per year in Peru. In terms of treatment success, the black bar again, the intervention households, this is patients completing treatment, being cured. We increased that from 53% to 64%, with an odds ratio of 1.8. Again, if we were to scale that up, 3,500 more patients with TB would have treatment success. Finally, what about those catastrophic costs? Well, you'll see that in the intervention households, in the dark bar, there was a significant reduction in catastrophic costs. However, there were 42% in the control households and 30% still in the intervention households. So nearly a third of those people still, despite the intervention, incurred catastrophic costs. Again, if we scale that up, that would mean that 3,700 fewer TB-affected households incur catastrophic costs in Peru per year. Now, intriguingly, throughout this whole process, we worked with the National TB Programme, and we also worked with the patients in terms of acceptability. And we asked them about feedback for all the interventions that we were doing, and the feedback was generally good or excellent for all the activities. When we asked them to rank the activities, you'll see that these four bars are the social elements, so educational workshops, TB clubs, home visits, and they actually ranked those activities of more importance to them than the conditional cash transfers. And that's something that's intriguing that we're looking into further with the patients and with our research team at present to see if it could help us to, to further refine the design of our intervention. So the conclusions of this study well, this novel socioeconomic intervention was feasible in an urban, impoverished, and challenging environment. We increased TB preventive therapy initiation in household contacts. We increased TB treatment success in TB patients. And we partly combated catastrophic costs, but I think there's more work to be done there. The feedback was generally very good from the patients, but it suggested actually that social activities were more highly rated than the economic, and we're looking into that. And we refined the intervention for further evaluation. 
In terms of the wider implications, talking about that other intervention it was refined for, we're actually rolling out now the community randomised evaluation of this intervention. So 32 shanty towns, 16 of which received the intervention. And that will look at secondary rates of TB disease and household contacts, so essentially TB control. But my study was not powered to do that. There's scale up of the intervention plan with the Peruvian TB programme. And more importantly, this gives an evidence base for that NTB strategy about catastrophic costs. We're starting to roll out the methodology we use and the threshold with the global cat catastrophic cost tool, uh, for example, now in Mozambique, in uh, Nepal, and in Vietnam. But beyond TB, this could refine, we could refine existing national cash transfer programs to be more TB sensitive. If you have TB, that could tick the box to say that you're able to be eligible for a poverty reduction scheme. And we aim to adapt the intervention. We, we could also adapt the intervention for other um, health conditions, such as non-communicable disease like diabetes or mental health illness. So thank you very much for your time, and thank you for listening. Thanks to the team and the households and to the Wu-Tang Clan. Well